Okay, four portions of scripture. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 17, Matthew chapter 6, Colossians chapter 3, and 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have been talking about um, the kingdom of God. And it is um, a massive topic, not because of all the different scriptures that are that talk about it, rather because it is at the very heart of the message of the gospel. Okay, the message. Let me step back. Not the message of the gospel. The entire scriptures. Okay, and the reason why I corrected myself is I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but there is more than one gospel that is referred to in the scriptures. As a very sh quick example, the gospel that John the Baptist preached is not the gospel that saved you and me. Okay? So that's all I meant by that. So I didn't want to be ca careless with my use of the word gospel. But the, the idea, for the lack of a better way of putting it, of the kingdom of God is right at the core of the entire message of the scriptures. Okay? And today, I just want to do a quick recap before we step into the next big section. I confess it's for my benefit, <laughs> almost as much as everyone, because the next thing that I want to talk about uh, is going to have to do with more things about the, what the scriptures talk about the end times. Okay? But the context is, my approach to all of this is going to be in the context of this glorious message that is embedded in the scriptures. Okay? And I'll remind you that what we're talking about has this original context. God created everything, and it was good. Okay? Uh, mankind was set in the best of circumstances. Okay? And because we understand these things from the other side of the tragedy of the fall, and we look back, I don't know that we can really adequately express or grasp the glory of what God had done. But it was perfect. There was nothing lacking, nothing missing. That's why God would say, it's good. It's good. I can rest now. Not that he was tired, but it, the idea there is it's done. Nothing left to be done. That was the environment that mankind operated in. And you know that as a result of the trickery of our adversary, the devil, Adam sinned. And as a result, everything was broken. Okay? But it's not like God was taken by surprise. right? It's not like God was taken by surprise, but rather, in view, uh, uh, in, there are many scriptures that imply it. Right from the get-go, he had planned for what would happen because Adam sinned. And it is that plan that we could give the title, the kingdom of God. So what is God's plan concerning restoring everything? We get back to God reigning. We get back to God reigning through the specifics of how he does that, of course, are, are worth considering. But the issue is this. The best place to possibly live is with God completely reigning. Okay? That's what was going on in, in the garden. It is worth noting, and as a sort of foreshadowing of what was to come, God then talked to Adam about reigning. Right? Take dominion. Okay? So it's like God gave him something that actually belongs to him for reasons that I think are worth considering through the scriptures. But this idea of reigning as being the solution to the problem is worth us paying attention to. So I'm going to start reading in, um, as I said, Genesis chapter 17. Let me pray, and then we'll just continue. And I hope to not be too long, but you know that I always hope to not be too long. So take that for what it's worth. Father, again, we bow the knees of our hearts before you, and we call on the name of the Lord, you who have rescued us, you who are our Father in heaven. We want your name to be glorified and hallowed in us and to us and then through us, Father. We want to see the glory of the Lord and the glory of what you have done, and we want to live this life in view of seeing how marvelous you are and excellent you are and how perfect you are in all your ways. And so we ask for help. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to teach us this morning. I ask for utterance in the opening of my mouth, that by your grace, what you want each one of us to hear would be set forth before us. 
But I also ask that you would set a guard and blow away and make of no effect what is merely the opinions of this man. I thank you, Father, that you yourself, the living God, is present here with us, that your spirit has come to teach us, and we ask for help. We ask for help. We commit ourselves into your hands. And I just thank you, Father. Be glorified. May Jesus be glorified in this time and in the times that flow from this time, the days and the minutes and the seconds that we have before you ahead of us from today, Father. We just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Okay, so from the fall onwards, there was already in motion through promises, there is coming someone who's going to reign and this will be the solution to the problem, right? Right from when the fall happened um, to God, uh, to Eve, God said, and your seed will crush this one, okay? And then through the revelation that's contained in all of the Older Testament, for example, there's a building up of this promise. And we get to the stage in this story where God chooses a man named Abram, okay? Just the guy, nothing special. He's living in Ur of the Chaldees, and God appears to him and says, I want you to leave. Leave everything you know. I want you to leave your country, your family, your father's house. I put that in the wrong order. And I want you to go to the land that I show you, and I will make a great nation of you. Okay? And then he throws this little line in, and through you, all the nations will be blessed. Okay? And I think everybody here has enough knowledge of the scriptures to know that this was where um, the, uh, God started to deal with this man, Abram, because through him, he was going to set aside a people that was going to glorify God. They were supposed to walk with God, and they were supposed to therefore show everybody else how marvelous God is. It didn't quite work out that way, okay? Because the Jews were people like us, okay? But my point for today is to say, again, buried in there is this thought of there's somebody coming, okay? So I'm going to read to you in Genesis chapter 17. Normally, we'd go to 12 and you'd see the promises there, but I want to jump ahead in the story of Abram, and um, we're going to read from 17 verse, what did I say? We're reading verse 6 onwards, okay? Well, let me start back in the beginning and then jump to six. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you through their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you. I will give to your descendants after you. I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I'll just stop there and just point out to you, part of the promise made to Abram was kings will come forth from you. Is that? Kings. Kings will come forth from you. Okay. Now, it's an interesting thing. We've talked about this before. The revelation that God has given us in the scriptures is not like mathematics, right? It's not like, let me state my starting assumptions and then here let me deduce or uh, derive for you all the conclusions. It's not like that because we aren't, <laughs> we aren't so precise and mathematical ourselves. But rather God's revelation of his plan comes in bits at a time and is... Um, demonstrated, decorated through the lives of the people he gets involved with. So Abram is a pretty significant example. And here again, he begins to talk to him. I'm going to do something through you. I remind you that the agenda actually is more than Abram. Okay? Even though Abram's thinking, you're going to do all this? And you know, there's a dialogue between God and Abraham. And you know, Abraham does stuff that's not the best. And then 
because of God's work in him, he comes to a place where God could say to him, I see that you listen to me. Before, it was, you listen to the voice of your wife. But now I see that you listen to me. And because of that, off we go. So, it, of course, God's involvement with Abraham made a big difference to Abraham. But God was also setting the stage for, I have a bigger agenda than just one man in his house. Through you, all the nations will be blessed. Fast forward, you know that um, he uh, makes a promise to a descendant of Abraham named David and said, there will be someone who will sit on your throne forever. Obviously not David, but there's someone coming. Okay? All throughout the Old Testament, there is this foreshadowing of there's someone coming. There's someone coming to him. Isaiah says, and the government of this guy, this guy, the government will be on his shoulders. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. No end. Right? So, woven into the history of the people of Israel, through who God was working in that dispensation, was this message, there's someone coming. And when he comes, it will be fabulous. And then he came. John the Baptist fulfilled the prophecy, there will be someone that comes before him and declares, make straight the way of the one coming. Make it straight. Get ready. And that's what John the Baptist preached, right? He said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? It was significant. It was significant, and then Jesus comes, right? And you know that in the, in the Gospels, it, it's recorded for us that Jesus, the first 30-odd years of his life, we don't know very much about. But then there comes a point in time where he himself comes to John. He's baptized in the baptism that John was offering for all the purpose of righteousness so that he could say, I've done everything that needed to be done. And John himself says, this is the one. He's here. He goes into the wilderness. He defeats the devil in all the temptations that the devil has to throw at him at that time. And he comes out. And what does he begin to do? He begins to say, it's time. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now remember, what is packed in that statement is, it's time for everything to be put back in order. It's time for evil to stop and righteousness to reign. It's time. It's time. The small problem was, the, king, the king's subjects rejected it, okay? And it's a worthwhile thing to see. Now, again, the wisdom of God is, again, evident because it's not like God said, well, what, what, you rejected him. Now what am I going to do? Because then it's almost like you see again. I have a bigger plan here than just what you see. I don't know if anybody's been to um, Banff and been on top of, Sulphur Mountain, you know how you can go up the gondola? I mean, maybe you climb mountains. I'm more the take the gondola up stage of my hiking career right now. But when you get up there and you look out, okay, we got to go to Germany. When, in Germany, when we saw Simona's parents, we got to go to the highest point in Germany, the Zugspitze in the Alps. And you just look out. And what you see is, uh, I think it's spectacular, but what you see is ridge and peak after peak after peak after peak. And when you're up at that vantage point, what you see is the peaks, right, Sp stretching out. In the scriptures, you could sort of draw a parallel like that. The scriptures, certainly the, concerning the kingdom, are spoken in that way. You see a peak and a peak and a peak. But what can escape your attention is between the peaks, there is a valley. It has a lot of stuff going on in it. And likewise here, the king comes. The king is rejected. The plan is not derailed. Something that they did not expect moves into motion now, right? There were prophecies concerning this coming king that if I was back then, at least I think, I think, like, how is that possible? Like, the Messiah comes and then he's cut off. Uh, I don't know what you guys do when, I come, when you come across a scripture that makes no sense. I just skip it. And I'm, I suspect that's what they did. How can you read... The, the, but God was pleased to crush his servant. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he would see his offspring. How do you parse that? How do you put that together? Wait, wait. God is going to crush this guy who has been promised right from the beginning? And 
if he gives himself as a guilt offering, he's going to have, how does that work? There was no thought about that. And you know that in the Newer Testament, uh, is it Peter who writes, the prophets of old who prophesied of this grace that would come to, they long to know, what are you talking about? And all that was told them was, it's not for you. It's for somebody yet to come. And that's the time that we're in, right? Unbeknownst, at least not clearly explained, until Jesus came and ushered in what he did, was this extraordinary time of grace that we live in. Let's have, just re recognize facts. At the moment, even though there is a land called Israel, there is no throne there that a king is ruling forever. Right? And in fact, if we uh, rewind, what, 70 years, 75 years? There was no Israel. Right? So. From the time that Jesus left to the time that Israel was created, what happened to the promises of God? Did they vanish? Did they disappear? Did he change plan? Now, I know that there, is, uh, there are many believers who think, well, God shifted. Because the Jews reacted the way they did, he changed plan. I'd like to say that doesn't make any sense. Because God is God and he knows the end from the beginning. For you to shift plan implies you didn't know this was going to happen. Because otherwise, why make all these promises? There will be somebody who reigns on the throne of David forever. Oh, I changed my mind. It's going to be the church. Doesn't make any sense to me. Okay? And I, I, I've said this to you before, and I'll say it to you again. I'm asking you to consider this and then weigh it before the Lord. I have no place in the church to tell you whatever I say is the truth, and you must agree. And you know that that's not how I've ever dealt with things here. Uh, I said it before you, I have a reason to think what I think, and I'm more than happy to work it out together with you. But at the end of the day, it's your walk with the Lord, right? You are free before him to say, ah, that Titus guy is completely off to lunch, okay? That's fine. Uh, I won't be offended, uh, at least not very much. <laughs> but it is worth recognizing. I have no place like That's not how the church is built, okay? Um, the time when... Those who could give a revelation from heaven that every believer must submit to, i.e., this, is gone. We still have people who can receive a word from heaven, but it does not carry the authority of this. In fact, all those words have to submit to this. Right? So who am I then to come and say, I got it. You got to listen to me, and if you don't listen to me, that's because you're not really a believer. No, come on. What I want to say, though, is God's plan did not get derailed when the Jews rejected Jesus. But rather, he opened up something that is, how does Paul put it? He uses the word mystery. Something, mystery does not mean, ooh, we don't know what God's doing. We can never understand it because he's so much bigger than us. It means something you could never have uncovered if God did not choose to reveal it. But he has revealed it. It's not merely, I'm hiding things from you, but rather, things you could not know, I want you to know. I have a plan to even bring the Gentiles in. And let me tell you about it. It's got to be by grace. And then you know that um, people like Paul, particularly, was used by God to set before us the marvelous salvation that he has rendered. Because reality is, if it was by the law, nobody gets in. You just don't measure up. At your best, you don't measure up. And it's worth noting, I don't know if you guys have ever had seasons where everything is going pretty good. You know, I've read my Bible every day, and I didn't get mad once. Things are going pretty good. And I can be tempted to think, I'm right with God, and not realize my little picture of what right with God means is so, so far low compared to the glory of God. How dare I make an assumption that the reason why things are great are because of I got it going now. It has always been because of Jesus and that blood that speaks on our behalf. And he wants our life built that way. The more and more confident we become in Jesus is my Savior, the more and more we are freed from the hold of sin in our life. Okay? I know that's a statement that's worth unpacking, but I don't have time today. But it's true. You will not be mastered by sin. Like, I mean, what kind of nonsensical statement is that? It would be a nonsensical statement, except that it's in the scriptures. 
Romans chapter 6. 5, sorry. No, 6. Sin shall not be master over you. It's 5. Sin shall not be master over you. Why? Because you're no longer under law. You're under grace. So he has done something in Jesus where your performance is not the deciding factor. It is your believing what Jesus has done for you. And he has unfolded this. Well, what happened to the promise of the kingdom? Has it disappeared? Yeah, it's on hold until, no, it is still the answer. But in the time that we're in, it manifests differently. I don't have, uh, already don't have time. Um, I don't have time to go over it again, but I said to you before, when we talk about kingdom, certainly the Old Testament promises were associated with a, a geographical kingdom, right? There is a capital city, there is a throne there, and the king rules from there and affects all the nations from it, okay? So there's a reason to think that. But really, what is a kingdom? A kingdom is a region where the will of a king is done, right? So we don't have any kings as is listed here. Um, I don't know how much you know about political theory. There's a difference between an absolute monarchy and a constitutional monarchy. Constitutional monarchy, the monarch still has to follow rules, right? We, there's almost, I think there's maybe one or two absolute monarchies where the king does whatever he wants, and it's just the way it is, okay? Well, the kind of kingdom that is referred to here when this everlasting kingdom is set up is an absolute one. No, there's no consulting with the people being ruled over. Hey, what do you guys think about doing this? The king just reigns. Okay? But the time that we live in now, as I said to you before, God is not a bully. He is not a tyrant. And this is something that is maybe a little bit hard to get our minds around, but it is the example of scriptures. The king came, right? Jesus the Messiah came. So what did he do? He went to Rome, knocked Caesar off, sat down and said, now it's my time. No. The king came, how? As a little baby born in a manger. Who did he speak to first? Who, who found out about it first? Shepherds. The lowest of the lowest of the low in society. Shepherd is not this romantic picture of the guy with the crook and, you know, looks cute and all that. It was the worst job you could have. That's who he comes and announces, the king is here. If this was an absolute monarchy in the sense of, I am going to reign now, is that how he would come? Absolutely not. And when they rejected him, what was his reaction? Forgive them. So we have plenty of reason to realize God does not bully people into doing what he wants. And if you are open-hearted to that, it explains a lot of why what happens on the earth happens. God does not always get what he wants in a circumstance. And that is a terrifying thought, but also an encouraging thought. Why do certain things happen in people's lives? It's not because God wants them harmed. I, will, I, will, I pray that the Lord strengthens me to the extent that to my grave I will say, God is not the author. He is not. He is the author of deliverance. I can say that to you, and I said it before you again. All you got to do is look at how Jesus behaved, right? Because you know that in Hebrews, he says, he is the exact representation of what God is like. If you want to know what God is like, don't go and find curses in the Older Testament. Yes, they're there. But if you really want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. So what did Jesus do? A bruised reed he did not break. A smoldering wick he did not put out. To those who thought they were something special, he got into it with them. Not because he hated them or they were extra evil, but they could not see how blind they were. They could not see how blind they were. And I don't think Jesus was arguing with them as much as, hey, wake up. You're putting your trust in yourself, and that will never do. And they got upset with him because he wasn't doing what... They thought the king would do. And you know what the king would do. They would, he would recognize how right we are. Yeah, we've been waiting for you. Oh, I'm glad you guys are here. Now it can work. That wasn't his reaction. You're dead men's tombs filled with whitewashed bones. 
That's not what the king is supposed to do. And they began, he began to unfold. This kingdom is not about an outward, exp outward appearance. It is about an inward condition that then spreads out from you and affects your life and the lives around you. So in other words, the kingdom of God, when we talk about the will of the king, your kingdom come, your will be done, in this time as it manifests, is all about God getting what he wants in a circumstance because someone like you showed up. Okay? Next passage I want to read to you. Sorry. Colossians chapter, uh, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and then Colossians chapter 3, and then we'll finish with Matthew chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, therefore, yeah, for the sake of time, therefore, you go and find out why he says therefore. We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were making an appeal through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So what are we now? We who have put our trust into Jesus. You know, everybody who is going to have a place with God, a, a relationship with God, is going to be through your faith in Jesus. Right? Nobody comes to the Father except through him. It doesn't matter your uh, enlightened thoughts about the principles that are in all these kinds of religions. And then we don't got to deny that religions have interesting concepts and principles. And, you know, quite honestly, if, if being right with God could be based on performance, there are some religions that are pretty hardcore, but it's not, right? It's not based on your performance. Rather, someone took your place. And if you are willing to believe what he did is accredited to you. And because of it, you have access to the throne of grace and you can live your life in fellowship with the living God. That's what's on offer. That's what's on offer. And part of that then becomes, I want my life to be an appeal to everybody else. Hey, look at what he's like. Come, come. We beg of you, not, the kingdom is here. If you don't listen to me, we're knocking heads. That is not the character of the kingdom of God. It is an appeal. I beg of you, be reconciled to God. Do you see the character of Jesus in this message that is set forth? I beg of you. Do you remember at one point in time, just before he is about to be crucified, he's coming into Jerusalem and he begins to weep. How I wanted to gather you, but you would not have. So it cannot be that he came with a crown and he's ready to conquer. Not yet. This time that we live in is a time where God is appealing. Come, come. And what is your place? To be an ambassador. We represent a king. What does an ambassador do? It represents a foreign government in a country, right? So the ambassador of the United States represents the interest of the United States here in Canada. We as ambassadors represent the interests of the king of kings in a land that does not yet bow to him. And what is the message? This is a time of grace. Come. Even you could come. Even you could come. Because if I could come, for sure you could come. Come, come. So this is the character of the kingdom of God. And it is to manifest, Colossians chapter 3. What does it look like? You know that there's more than one place in the Newer Testament where um, the person writing uh, describes, he, usually if it's Paul, for example, there's a pattern where he first talks to you about what God has done, what Jesus has done for you, and then says, so, you ought to do this. Okay? That's where I'm taking you here in Colossians. Last time I took you to Ephesians, but in Colossians chapter 3, so, verse 12. As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Knock heads! Is not what he says. Put on a heart of compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone. In other words, let the character of the kingdom of God manifest through you. Let this kingdom that you represent show up through you. Why? As I've said to you before, and I don't think I invented the statement, there are people who wanted to be a Christian, and then they met one. And it completely turned them off. And I wish I could say that I've always been the example of what you want to be as a Christian, but I'm sure I've turned people off. Why? Because what I manifested was not the kingdom of God. We end in Matthew chapter 6. Verse 33. It's in the context of, why are you worried about what you're going to eat? God knows that you need all this stuff, but then he says, here's what I want you to be preoccupied with. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In other words, the point of our life cannot be about all these material, external things that we need. There's, anybody who says to you, is lying. Somebody else is paying their bills. That's why they don't need money. Right? Somebody who just says, I, I, I don't need sleep. Come on. We need a place to live. We need a place. We need shelter. We need food. We need companionship. We need, there are things that we need. Right? So it is not the case that we don't need those things. But how he puts it is, you know, your priority needs to be this thing called the kingdom of God, i.e., the will of the king manifesting on earth. There is coming a time when the king himself will see to it. But this time of extraordinary grace, it is to come through people submitted willingly to him. Okay? The goal here is not, God is not after, ah, you're bigger than me, so I'll do whatever you want me to do. And off you go. I confess I've been there. I have been on missions because I thought God wanted me to go, but I hated the idea of it. Not quite what God was after. Okay? And I will I'll just add, I am astonished at the extraordinary grace I met on that mission trip, even though I went on the completely wrong attitude. My attitude at that time was, indeed, if you want to do something, then you know for sure God doesn't want it. God only wants you to do stuff that you don't want to do. So just get used to it and do it. And yet, I went to Mexico. I don't speak any Spanish. We had these little, tra uh, these little tracks. And we were supposed to, after showing the Jesus movie, go in. Just think about this. I don't know Spanish, but I'm supposed to read this Spanish tract to this guy. And so I, you know, bumble my way through it. And then at the end, it asks, do you want to give your life to the Lord? And the guy goes, I'm thinking, <laughs> There was a Spanish guy, like a Mexican church member there as well. And I said, can you ask if you understood what I just said? Because how could that possibly be? And I discovered, actually, God is just looking for someone willing. Not someone that's particularly capable. Not to say that you shouldn't study to show yourself approved and to be a diligent worker. He's just looking for someone willing. Because he so loves the people that you're interacting with. He's not counting on you being this extraordinary thing. What he's counting on is the grace that is going to manifest through your willingness is so much bigger than all of our weaknesses put together. It's okay. You just get to have the adventure of seeing God do something. And then thereby, you begin to say, I actually like this kingdom. I really like this kingdom. Hey, I like this. And your message goes from, you better repent, otherwise God is going to throw you to hell, to, listen, God has made a way out. We're heading for hell, but he has made a way out. Will you take it? He so loves you. No, I'm not interested, but you know what? God bless you anyway. Because even though you reject him, he doesn't reject you. He wants you to be helped anyway. And it, it, it changes you as you, get, as you begin to be affected by what the king himself is like. 
So I'll end here and then just say something about where we're going to head to. So this kingdom of God, let me, what does it have to do with your life? I got bills to pay. I got a car that's not working. I got family that's driving me crazy. I got situations. I got circumstances. I'm sick. I'm not well. So-and-so is not well. What, is, what does this all kingdom of God have to do with it? Remember, this idea of the kingdom of God is God's solution for everything to be restored. Okay? It is the solution, capital T, capital S, to the problem called the fall of mankind. And it is to manifest first by God getting what he wants in you. So every place where you say to the Lord, I want your kingdom, I want your good pleasure here. When I have to respond to this witch of a sister that I have, I want you to be pleased with it. Because if your kingdom is coming, it's the best of all circumstances. So what I'm after is you getting what you want in my circumstance. If you choose to submit your life to that pattern, I know it's not like a once and done thing. We grow in it. There are things that are easy for me to submit to. There are things that I am not ready to submit to, if I'm honest. I, I, not that I can identify them for you. I don't wake up my morning and say, let me think of where I can rebel against the Lord. But that doesn't mean there aren't places of rebellion in my life. I just haven't become aware of them yet. And in his kindness, this is the wonderful thing about our Father. He doesn't require you to be where you will be next Saturday. He just requires you to be here today and respond to him today. Here, I don't mean the church service. I mean where you are today. That's where he'll meet you. We get preoccupied. I ought to be doing this. I ought to be doing that. Actually, the only thing you ought to be doing is listening to him today. He'll take you to the next place. He places me on my high places. He makes, you know, Psalm 18, he teaches me to bend a bow of bronze. He makes me to stand on my high places. Not, get up there and let me know when you get up there. That's not him. So, choose. Take at least this from this section of the messages concerning the kingdom of God. The best thing I can do is getting making sure God gets what he wants in me in this circumstance. Because that is God winning. And if God wins, then good things happen. Where are we going to go from here? Okay, so we're in a time where the king has come, the people that he was to reign over and reign through rejected him, a period of grace that was unexpected, where God is dealing primarily with the Gentiles, but really the, his hand is extended to everyone. Right? But the way to be right with him now is, through Jesus. So what happened to all those promises about a king coming and reigning and all that kind of stuff? Does it go away? Well, there are some people who would say God's design is now that is the church. Okay, God is reigning through the church. That's what he meant by the kingdom of God. But, you know, he makes awfully specific promises to Israel and to Judah. Very specific promises. That if all of a sudden we become the church, it doesn't make any sense, really. In fact, Paul in the book of Romans, after having taken eight chapters to talk about the grace, what does he do next? Let me talk to you about Israel. God's not done. God's not done. So what I want to consider again is, so how does this all begin to unfold in terms of the grander promise, the bigger promise? We are in a section of this grand story, what happens next? And why do we need to know? Well, let me answer that question first. Why do we need to know how things are going to happen? I don't know if you can think about a time that was very difficult in your life. And it was, please don't tell me, that's every day. Okay? There have been times when it was extraordinarily hard and God got you through it. That's what I'm asking you to consider. If you think about it, in the time that you were going through that and everything was uncertain, it was very easy to be tempted. I don't know how this is going to work out. This, is not, this may not work. In fact, Paul in one place says, we had the sentence of death within ourselves, thinking this might be it. This might be it. Okay? But then, fast forward, God does what he does and he rescues you and now you're looking back at it. What is your thought about it now? What is your thought about that horrible time that you went through where you weren't sure what was going to happen, but now looking back at it, you say, you know what? God saved me. He rescued me. I don't know why I was so worried. God came through. I don't know if you say that. <laughs> I sometimes think about things that I did, and I thought, there's just no way this is going to work. And then it works. Not it worked, meaning everything fell into place. God did something. 
And I'm thinking, why was I worried in the first place? What happened? How did that happen to you? Well, if you knew the end from the beginning, you'd have a very different reaction to trouble than when you don't know the end from the beginning. And by no means am I saying to you that the Bible sets before you a promise about exactly everything that happens to you for the now and when all is fulfilled. And nor am I suggesting to you that I'm the expert who can teach you all of these things. But I am telling you, one of the reasons that prophecy is given in Scripture is to strengthen you today. Okay? I cannot tell you. I am starting to be, this is my own opinion, take it only for that. I'm starting to be concerned about the time that we live. Concerned meaning, not all, oh, isn't it terrible what's happening, but you know what? I live in a pretty comfortable place. A, a land that is in peace, by the grace of, and kindness of God, but that's threatened by, you know, stuff, more stuff. But I'm talking about politically. We're, it's quite possible we're heading to the kind of thing that was happening at World War II. You know, the kinds of things that are at play. And so all the stuff that I'm used to assuming, well, tomorrow morning I'll get up and do the stuff I gotta do. What if that's not the case? What happens if something now happens that actually tears everything we're used to apart? Are we lost? No. We still have a part to play in what God wants to do. How do we do it if we're fighting for our lives? Well, this is part of the reason why God gives prophecy. It's not to inform us, and then if we behave the way we uh, church people often behave, it's not to debate. Well, I think it's this. Well, you're completely an idiot, that's why. Well, you should just read your Bible. As soon as you see those kinds of debates, you say, both of you guys are saying to read the Bible, and yet you're arguing with each other. Something is not quite right here. It's not to have debates. It's not to have philosophical discussions. I mean, don't get me wrong. You, people who know me, you know I love philosophy, and I love the deeper, what, like, what is going on underneath it? But its purpose is to strengthen you for today so that you have courage to put your trust in God today. Whatever comes. Do you remember in... in in the book of Hebrews, there's a list in Hebrews chapter 11 where he talks about all the things that people of faith went through. And it kind of ends not with the final chapter, but and stuff like this, and how did they do it? You know, there are people who were willing to be sawn in half. People who were willing to be stoned. Like you saw Paul, how he went through it. How do you do that? How does a person do that? Jesus himself said, when one of his disciples took a sword and cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. Jesus himself said, hey, don't you realize I could just ask and a legion of angels would be here. What is it that causes a person in a situation where he could die, he chooses differently? What is it? It is a grace that comes from God that we are going to be in need of. I'm not threatening anybody here. And I'm not trying to say, oh, yeah, of course, everything. It, it could very well be that we have the next 50 years in peace. Okay? I'm not trying to tell you. But whatever it is, you have to be ready to stand. You have to be ready to stand holding fast to what God has offered to us. And you get to see two things. One, the effect of the grace of God on you. And two, the effect of the grace of God on those around you. And God gets what he wants. Okay? That's why we need to consider these things. Yes, it's interesting considering what is the preterist position versus the, you know, hey, great, marvelous, wonderful. The scriptures are this grand adventure book that is open to you, and God say, follow me. Come and find out. Come and find out. But its real purpose is to get you ready for the exploits you've been appointed to do in the time that we live. Okay? And that's why I think we need to consider it. God is just extraordinarily good. He's just astonishingly, marvelously, more than enough for whatever you and I are going through. That's where we want to live. And that's where we want to stir other people to live. Right? I'll just end by saying, you know, if you have no idea what I'm talking about, to you, being a Christian just means you go to church. Please come and talk to me, because that's not what it's about. It's about a friendship with the living God who made all things that you begin to see what you could never have seen before, just the depth of the love of God for you and what it means. What it means. What does it mean that God loves you so much that he gave his son for you? What is that supposed to accomplish? That's what this is about. Okay? 
Father, we now just present ourselves and ask you to win us over to your perspective. Win us over to the truth where we are still after our own way. Just come and rescue us, Father, in Jesus' name. And so we just commit this time, the effect of it, all into your hands, and we ask you to bring glory to Jesus through each one of us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for bearing with me.